Good evening. Uh, it, and it's entirely up to you. If you'd like to have your face shown or not, I'm happy to look you right in the eye. And if, if you feel more comfortable not, that's fine too. Uh, my name is Michael Walsh. Uh, thank you for showing up this evening. I'm here to talk a little bit about my book. And I see that I have my sister's picture is framed in the upper right corner, one of my one of my seven sisters, and uh, I'm, uh, so I'll just start. I live in Morgan Park. Uh, the book I've written is titled Jimon, that's spelled Z-H-I-M-O-N. Uh, Jimon is, for those of you who are not fluent in Cree Indian, Jimon is the Cree word for canoe. And my book, the backbone of my book, is a canoe journey that I took when I was 40 years old. Uh, I started, I launched my canoe just above the Lachine Rapids, which are in Montreal. And by the time I f hurt myself on a very famous part of the fur trade route across Canada, that was the, the path I followed, uh, I had traveled about 3,500 miles. Uh, as you can imagine, there were lots of interesting stories that took place with that. Uh, I'll tr try and touch on some of them this evening. Uh, much of that trip, again, it was following the fur trade route across Canada and there it, it, it's a little bit of a misnomer because the fur trade route is actually a, 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 a whole series of paths that were developed uh, and utilized by, of course, the First Nations people for millennia. And then after that, when the, the, the uh, voyagers traveled those same routes, carrying the, uh, the, the trade goods to the interior and back and uh, the big driving force, of course, was beaver pelts. They were used in men's hat fashions in Europe during that time period. Uh, and uh, the, they started out on the East Coast. And interestingly enough, most of the fur trade route developed from the East Coast and went all the way across to the West Coast. Very, the Russians uh, had very little influence on the exploration of Canada uh, that resulted because they, uh, you know, my reading suggests they came no more than about 100 miles up uh, after they crossed the Bering Strait. They only came about 100 miles up the Yukon River. They really weren't much of a force, much. Uh, so it's really kind of interesting when you think about it that you can travel in a canoe. Uh, it's a lot of hard work and there's a lot of portages and much of the way is up river, but you literally can travel from Montreal to Alaska and the Yukon River by canoe. Uh, the biggest barrier, physical barrier, other than the fact that much of that distance, much of the 3,500 miles that I did, much of it was up river. Uh, but once you, get into the Mackenzie River system, you've got one last hurdle, which is the Richardson Mountains, and that's the tail end of the Rockies as they die into the Arctic Ocean. But it, it's doable, it's been done many times. Uh, the, the 49ers did it, it was one of the routes into Alaska during the gold rush. So anyway, that's the backbone of my story. Uh, uh, and and in it, I use that to uh, to talk about a number of other things in my life. Um, some of them quite difficult to talk about generally until I I, I wrote the book. But uh, I, I I'm I'm not quite sure be, because I've given a presentation to others before, but they all had read the book beforehand, so they came prepared with questions. So it's a little difficult for me to kind of see what part of the, the journey you would be most interested in. Uh, 
let's see, um, in order, some might wonder how I got, I was, I was in the summer of my 40th year, some would wonder, how did I get my wife to agree to me doing such a thing? And uh, that was a big part of the trip as my wife, Patricia, had lived in Australia for a number of years, about five years total. And uh, so we arranged while I was traveling through Canada, she would travel and visit family and friends in Australia. So that was part of kind of the trail of the deal to get someone to, uh, to agree to me doing such a thing. Uh, I had my canoe, the name of my book, Jimon, comes from the name that I gave my canoe, which is Jimon. And that was, uh, that, that was a custom made canoe for me. Uh, this trip took place 33 years ago when Kevlar, which is very common material in canoes now, was not, uh, was just coming onto the scene, at least marine grades of Kevlar, bulletproof material. And uh, my canoe was one of the first ones made of that by a company in British Columbia called Western Canoeing. They're still in business. They still make the solitude model of canoe, which is uh, the model that I took on that trip. And it proved to be a very durable craft. Um, if in the story, I talk about how when I was hurt and I just about had reached the limits of what I could do, I was flown out of a place called Rendezvous Lake. Uh, Rendezvous Lake, again, is a very historic part of the fur trade route. As the name implies, it's where the traders uh, would rendezvous towards the end of the trapping season. They would exchange trade goods for pelts, and then everyone would head home before winter shut them down for the year. And it was at that place where I, of all things, I damaged my feet. And it was impractical for me to continue. And I was, uh, at that point, I was behind where I was supposed to be in the schedule. My wife was waiting out in front of me. A search was initiated for me. Uh, um, a man, uh, she, a man who knew the fur trade route, he had a fly-in fishing camp, he knew the fur trade route, and he knew if I was, had come that far, he knew that I could only be at one place on this particular portage, the Methy portage, and because uh, it was the only place where there was water, <clears throat> which was uh, unusual on my trip because obviously water was good, clear, beautiful water was available to me at all times and all places, except on that portage, it has a unique characteristic of being a true height of land and there is no water on that portage to get to Rendezvous Lake. And uh, I, he, he, he knew where I was, so I was holed up there and he, he flew in and he flew me out. Um, that's kind of an interesting part of the story, how I, I got trapped in some quicksand got myself out of it, made a mistake, navigation error. My last five weeks of my trip, I navigated with just the sun in my wristwatch because I had lost gear when I swamped uh, about five weeks before the end of my, my trip. So um, there are lots of little stories. I, it's just a little hard for me to figure out exactly what would be the most interesting parts of it for you. Um, let's see, I suppose maybe some of the people that I met along the way in isolated places are for me to this day, some of the, the, uh, the most wonderful memories of the trip. Um, uh, I, I met, uh, there, it, there is on the trip one section of it goes uh, that is how one can enter the boundary waters if those of you who know where the boundary waters canoe areas it are between Canada and the United States the eastern extremity the extremity of that is the uh, Pigeon River and 
the way into the, in recent history, the way into the Pigeon River is through a portage called the Grand Portage. It's a nine mile carry that cuts off some waterfalls that make it very difficult to get into the Rat River, uh, Pigeon River. And uh, on the, this long nine mile portage, and I should add here that because of the amount of gear I carried and my canoe, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, I most portages of any significance were always done three times because I would take my pack up a certain distance, then I would come back, I'd get my canoe and carry it up. So the 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 grand the nine miles of the Grand Portage was a significant carry. And at the end of the day, four men came down the trail. Uh, they were buddies since their college days, and they were going on the Grand Portage. Not many people find that an interesting thing to do on their vacation, but they did it and they did it regularly. And we chatted for just a couple moments and they went on their way and I just flopped where I was. I'd been, I was done for the day, about a mile from where the landing is. Next day, as I approached the landing there, the end of their canoe was disappearing up stream because at that point, the Pigeon River is flowing out into uh, Lake Superior, Lake Superior, yeah. And uh, so again, I'm paddling upstream as I go into it. A uh, short distance later, after I get into actually up the river and into the boundary waters, those four men were mate waiting for me. And there's a part of fur trade history that's quite unique and they, the five of us participated in it and that is there is a portage called the Height of Land Portage. And it historically divided the easy life and the, the relatively easy living conditions back in Montreal. That was the Height of Land and that divided from that to the, the wild country and all the adventures and wealth that was waiting for those who ventured across the height of land. It was treated somewhat like uh, crossing the equator, the King Neptune uh, ceremony, except that when you cross it, you have to take the Voyager's Oath. And the Voyager's Oath, they, they made me uh, take the Voyager's Oath. They made me kneel. They had brought with them a cape just in case they came across someone to make sure they took the Voyager's Oath. Put the cape on my shoulder, made me kneel, got some rush, rushes that were growing by the side of the lake, cut them off, dipped it in the water, splashed it on my head and made me take the oath. The oath is twofold. One is I would promise never to take, let anyone go across the height of land portage without taking the Voyager's Oath. And the second one was, the second part of it was, I promise never to kiss another Voyager's wife unless I asked her permission first. And <clears throat> as you can see, those four guys I remember to this day very well, and I have been in touch with them all these years later. And they, they've read the book and they enjoy my, my, uh, my uh, uh, recounting of our, our uh, little adventure together there. So, uh, my, my trip was filled with those kinds of people in odd, in strange, isolated places. And uh, it was filled with uh, some glorious moments and some moments that uh, were life-threatening. I, I got my foot uh, caught in, a, in a, a nest of rocks on the, pit, the uh, Mattawa River. And it was at the end of the day, it was early enough in the trip, it was still cold, the water was very cold. And I, because again, I was going up river, there are some places where you just can't, the water's too fierce, you can't paddle through it. And it's the, 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 the river is full of obstacles. So you have to rope your way around them. Uh, roping is usually done as a two man thing. Someone holds the canoe and someone else goes out front and and then pulls on a on a, a 
a lead that pulls the canoe up to the turbulent water. But uh, doing it by myself uh, was, of course, at least twice demanding, if not more. And uh, it took a careful choreography to make it work. And I attempted to do one more for the day uh, when, as I say in my book, uh, fatigue muted caution. And I was driven to keep moving and uh, I made a big mistake and it could have been a fatal one when my foot got caught and the, the river hit me now chest high and I, I didn't have anything left for the fight. And the canoe, which I had behind me, uh, you know, I'm carrying a rope to pull a canoe up around this next boulder and snag that are in front of me. Uh, I could feel it starting pressure on my neck, which meant the canoe was starting to float out into the river. And if the canoe flipped on me that day and I lost all my gear, I'd been in a very difficult situation. But of course, it wouldn't matter because I was going to go under pretty quick and I wasn't going to, I didn't have what it took to come back up. So uh, in that time, I just made a decision that I'd let the river, as I say in my book, I let the river have me. I flipped the lead over the top of my head. I spun around and I went underneath the water and interest, it just happened to work out that the current then took me down and took my foot by having it at a different angle, I was able to get out of that trap I was in. And uh, I was able to get my canoe back. Hypothermia was, was making a strong run for me at that point, but I was able to uh, salvage the, the day and the situation. And, and there's nothing like a good meal and a good night's sleep. And then I figured out how to get around it the next day. But if the trip was filled with little moments like that. And uh, I survived. I survived all of them. So here I am. So far uh, now, um, Stephanie hasn't. I don't think Stephanie mentioned it. But as I go along, and questions occur to you, there is a chat board you have somewhere in front of you, and I can see your chat. So if you wanted to ask me a question. I'm, I'm more than happy because it could be a catalyst for maybe touching on something that's more uh, of an interest to all of you. Um, I will tell you something. I just was looking at my book and there's something I forgot about my book. You think it took me five years to write. You think there wouldn't be anything about it I had forgotten, but I'm looking at the cover. I don't know if you can see it here, but when I, I got a publisher, <clears throat> she asked me at one point, Excuse me, I've got a little bit of a frog here. Yeah, thanks, Margaret. That's my sister, Margaret. Uh, she's, you can see it there a little bit. She asked me what I, what, had I thought about what I want for a cover? And I said, well, I, I, I just, I think it should be a simple cover. It should have the name Jimon and it should just have maybe a, a stylized canoe on it. And I said, that's enough. I don't, I think a plain cover should work fine. So she said, send me what you think. So right here at the desk where I'm at now, I got a, a marker off my whiteboard, a blue and yellow marker. And I had a black marker in my drawer and I took a sheet of copy paper and I just drew what looked like a canoe. And I gave it some yellow highlights because my canoe was yellow uh, and a little, did a little blue on the bottom just to give an idea of what the water might look like. And I sent it to her and she said, yeah, we'll use that. So uh, on inside the front cover of my book, I sort of forgotten about it. I'm acknowledged as the illustrator, uh, what is it, cover art? I can't I don't get my glasses on, but cover art, Michael Walsh. So I'm, I'm famous as a cover artist now. Anyway, that that's just a little story. So <clears throat> had I canoed before this trip, uh, I'm, so as, as these, as these uh, chat messages come in, I'll, I'll respond to them. Uh, had you canoed before this trip? The answer to that is yes. Not very much, but 
one time and intensely. I was a Marine in Vietnam and one of the Marines I served with and I got together about a year after we were both in Vietnam. So we, went, we hadn't been back very long and we decided we'd have an adventure and we decided it would be in Canada and we decided it would be a canoe adventure, although neither one of us had ever canoed before. So we, we bought a big old heavy aluminum canoe and all the gear we thought we'd need and we shipped ourselves up far to, uh, uh, to Winnipeg. We flew to Winnipeg and then we took a very slow train all the way up from Winnipeg to a place called Lynn Lake, Manitoba. And then we got a ride on a truck that took us across to Reindeer Lake. And we lived in Reindeer Lake for about three months. Had a wonderful adventure, canoed all the time, canoed all over that lake. Uh, <clears throat> I write about some of that in the book because we had a UFO adventure there that was, that still, uh, raises uh, goosebumps on my arm now these 40 plus years later almost 50 years afterwards it was still quite unusual so yes the short answer to that is I had canoed before in reindeer but I had not canoed for 16 years prior to my my trip the Jiman trip in Canada which was a solo project uh, and from Gina that was from Therese and from Gina, I have the question, what led to your decision to make this trip? Well, that's probably at the core of the book. I could talk to you a lot about how. How does one organize the equipment, the food, a one man, I'm a one man band. How did I get all of that together? All of the minutiae that makes you able to start and even have any kind of chance succeeding at doing something like this and that that's a lot of information i could i could i always i could always write about that <clears throat> but what i couldn't always write about was what gina has just asked me is why and there are a lot of things in my life i go into the detail in the book things that were part of my duties as a Ford Observer Scout in Vietnam, as a Marine, uh, other events, the killing of a man later in my life. These things were all part of, of, of what I, I thought I was going to resolve with a trip in the wilderness. And the reality was, Gina, is that when I came home, I, I learned that I could never run far enough and I could never run far away enough uh, to resolve it. And it took me many years, but eventually I sought professional help and uh, abstained from alcohol. Uh, suffered some things that were traumatic that, that demanded that I resolve issues. And, um, and so it was then after I, uh, after I figured out how to write about the whys as much as the hows that I was able to write the book. So it's an interesting question. It's pretty hard to go into here, but if, if you read the book, I, I hope I explain it more clearly there. Let's see, other questions. Um, I, I, I had a, I had, towards the end of the trip, uh, well, I, I swamped on my birthday, which is July 2nd. I've just, just had one a couple days ago. And, and yes, I am now 38. Uh, no, I'm not 38, I'm 73. Uh, I, uh, I swamped. I swamped at a place called Crew Rapids. Again, because I was traveling by myself and I always was looking at, had an internal time clock of wanting to complete the trip. 
and the trip was at that point, I'd modified it slightly. My goal was to cross the Arctic Circle on the Mackenzie River. I thought if I could do that, that would be quite an accomplishment. And uh, with no backup team, I just had to, I just had to figure out how to make it happen on my own. And I'd done pretty well with it, but I swamped. I made a mistake. I pushed too hard. I pushed a day I should have rested. I pushed, and it was a hard day to begin with. And at the last 20 feet when I would have been in safe place, I lost concentration and I lost a lot of equipment, including my compass and the current section of map I had. Well, I, 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 because I spent a lot of life of my working life in the solar energy business, I was quite accustomed to looking at the sun and being aware of where the sun was at times of the day. So for about five weeks, I knew, navigated by using the sun in my wristwatch. I could figure out where I was on my maps. Uh, when I got to this very historic portage called the Methy Portage, I was elated. I'd come a long ways. I'd overcome many obstacles. My feet were damaged, but I didn't allow that to slow me down and I saw a trail. There's a, there is at this portage uh, an obelisk that commemorates its place in the history of the fur trade route. And there's a trail that runs right in front of it. And I took that trail because I was, of course, why wouldn't I? It was the right, it was the portage trail. And I walked that trail for many miles until about nine o'clock at night when I realized that it was not the Portage Trail. I had gone the wrong way. And I would have known that right away if I'd checked my, my map and watch against the sun, but I just was so elated I did not, something so simple I just didn't do. Ended up having my, my feet became so damaged I couldn't, I couldn't go on any further and there was an, a place where I thought I could make a shortcut and I could, it, it turned out to be a clear cut through the woods that went from where the trail I was on to the trail I was going to, I was looking for the portage. And there was a gully in this area and there was uh, the people who had done the clear cut they had dropped a pole on it and they'd used that to walk back and forth when they were working on that part of the cut. And it was a little wobbly, but I was able to navigate it with my, my feet were very sore, but I was, I fortified it with some rocks and things so it didn't move too much. I went back to gully to get my canoe. I had it up on my shoulders, of course, and I got about halfway across and the wind picked up and it was just enough that I lost my balance and I went off the log and I went down into what can only be described as quicksand. It's a, a bog-like material. And if I didn't have my canoe in my shoulders, I'd gone, I, uh, Lord knows when I would have stopped. But the canoe caught on both sides of this narrow channel. So I was suspended up to my armpits in this muck. And uh, it was a challenge for me to somehow extricate myself because there, there wasn't there wasn't anybody going to come by there, give me a hand. I either had to figure out how to get myself out or not. And by by just dint of just slowly working my hand along that gunnel and pulling myself just inches at a time, I was able to get out. But it's again the story is filled with all sorts of things that happen that that. Um, and it's it's kind of hard to put it all in context when you're talking to someone who hasn't read the whole story and all the bits and pieces that lead up to it and the bits and pieces at the end of it. So uh, let's see what I have here. Uh, Teresa asked me, did you have a rescue beacon or were they not available then? Uh, this was 33 years ago. The internet wasn't available then. Satellite phones weren't available. Uh, I do I do write about in the book how I tr how I thought about transmitting on shortwave. On um, so I got part of my story was 
and the preparation is I practiced for and got a um, technician's license in Morse code. Uh, and then I wrote to the Radio Relay League, they're the people that monitor the shortwave uh, frequencies around the world. And I got permission to transmit on voice. So they gave me a short time, just I was an exception. You had to, you had to have more experience. There was a more detailed exam. You had to, uh, I, I think you, your send and receive rates for CW had to be higher than what they were for a technician. But in any event, they gave me a waiver so that on my trip I could, brought, I could use short wave. Problem was the smallest unit I could find weighed 30 pounds and it was about, I write in my book when I got the brochure on it, it looked about as seaworthy as a pinata. So uh, that did not work out. Although somewhere I think I still have a practice key, but uh, that wasn't gonna work. And uh, no, there, were, there's a, there was nothing I could transmit with for a rescue beacon. Uh, I, how I communicated was a couple of ways. One is I carried postcards with me and as I'd get to uh, settlements, I would send my wife a note as to where I was and how I was doing. Uh, I, uh, again, interesting element of the story is I made contact with the Hudson's Bay Company, which at that time still ran stores in the North Country, literally trading posts, and I established a line of credit with them. So I made a deposit in Montreal at their headquarters, and then as I traveled, and came across Hudson Bay Company stores, which I didn't use more than twice, I don't think. Uh, that was another way that I let people know where I was. Uh, and a an, an third way was I any, any settlement that I came to that had an RCMP outpost, a Royal Canadian Mounted Police outpost, I would go, I'd tell them who I was, where I started, where I was headed, and uh, that, that that was another way to keep track of me. Uh, and an interesting way, a way I hadn't anticipated is several people I met along the way actually took my name and tele telephone number and called my wife. I, I lived in California then, called my wife and let her know. Uh, uh, let her know where I was and how I looked. And uh, it, that was a that was a surprise. I, I wasn't, didn't think that I, that would be a way I communicate. But other than that, uh, if, as I said in the book, if, if I came across a problem, there wasn't anybody there to solve it for me. I, I had to figure it out myself, either keep, keep from having the problem or once I had it, I had to figure my way out of it by hook or by crook. Uh, so it's a interesting trip. People, I, I don't think, I don't think anybody would take a trip like that now. They wouldn't have to because now if they were to do the same thing, they'd have a satellite phone. Uh, perhaps if anyone asked me, I'd say, don't go unless you have a backup team because there are just cert certain things that eat up to, if your goal is to get from A to Z, then a backup team is necessary because there's so many things that just eat up your time and your energy that a backup team can help you with. So no, no rescue beacon. Uh, let's see. And from Camp Luna Linda, I read your book. What chapter, story, memory surprised you? A golden memory. Um, I, I'd have to say there were moments that um, were magical. I mean, it sounds like the whole trip was a lot of hard work, and it was. It was not one of these, it wasn't where I pick a nice spot and I'd camp for a day or two. I was, if I was in a spot, it's because the weather would not allow me to continue. It was just beyond my capabilities of battling through the water. Uh, otherwise, I moved, and I moved, uh, even in the early days, I'd moved. Know, seven or eight, what, uh, as much sunlight as there was is when I was moving. So seven or eight hours. And then towards the end, there were, it was not unusual that I'd canoe for 12, 13, 14 hours in a day. Um, that's what you have to do if you're going to kind of cover the ground there as a solo canoeist. Uh, 
but I so but there were in the midst of all that there were a few moments in places where the weather was just perfect, where my body was just perfect, where the sun was just perfect, uh, the breeze was perfect, that were as close to magic as probably I can imagine. Yeah, there were moments like that. Um, I can't think of one in particular now, but there were those were the kinds of moments that took place that were hard to anticipate and wonderful surprises when they occurred. Um, okay, I'm starting to stutter and stammer here. Someone better send me a question. So have you thought about repeating this trip? Would you encourage others to make this trip? Uh, Gina, let's see. If I pick you up at 5.30 tomorrow morning, uh, I have. You're one of, I think you may be the first person who's asked me a question that I've always thought someone should ask, which is, do I think the trip is doable? And the, the original trip, the trip that I modeled myself on was a trip from Montreal all the way through the Mackenzie River system, over the Richardsons, down the Yukon to the Bering Strait. And that trip was done in one season by a two-man team. Uh, Verlin Kruger and Clint Waddell did that in 1971. Uh, they were a couple of uh, uh, marathon canoeists and uh, they were pretty weathered and pretty seasoned guys. They, they, were, they, were, the kind of, they were the kind of guys that could do it. I don't, I don't know how well it ended up for them at the end, but um, to answer your question more specifically, have I ever thought about repeating this trip? No. N, O, no. But have I ever thought about what it would, would I encourage others to make the trip? Yeah. And I think it could be done solo, which would be a, a, a real challenge. No one has made that trip to the best of my knowledge solo all the way from, from Montreal to, uh, to the Bering Strait. Uh, but I think it could be done, but it has to be the right craft and it has to be the right person. They have to be, my guess would be, they have to be between 30 and 40. It's not gonna be a 25 year old. I think it's, there, there's too much, there, there's too many mental, challenges that go on. I could be, you know, I'm, I'm being a bit presumptuous or maybe a 25 year old somewhere even listening to this who says, what the hell you mean? I can't do it. But I, th I think you need to be, if, if you're not in very good shape in a couple of days, you'll be beat up. If you're in really good shape in three or four weeks, you're going to be pretty beat up. After that, it's just working every day when you're beat up. And that, in my experience, comes more with being, uh, in the 30 to 40 year old bracket than it does to be in a 25 year old bracket. Just, you know, we just, you haven't at 25, you haven't been beat up enough to do the trip. <laughs> You've got to be used to being beaten up and then being cold and then being figuring out how to make yourself comfortable in uncomfortable situations. You, you just have to have a lot of, a lot of bits and pieces have to come together. And um, I happen to have those bits and pieces. I just, I just, couldn't move fast enough, but with a different craft and someone who I didn't, wouldn't have to carry what I had to carry, the, it, the resupplies were more regular, so you didn't have to carry very much portaging, what could be worked out to be a much faster process. Uh, I think, uh, I think I, I'd encourage someone to try it. Absolutely, why not? And you could do it a lot safer than me, probably, if you had, you know, a backup, and then you had some way of communicating with the outside world if you got in a jam from someone who's listening and monitoring and wanting to hear, you know, caring where you are and being able to do something about it if you get in trouble. How much and what type, uh, from Blue Island, how much and what type of prep work did you 
have to do before starting a project, your trip? Well, uh, f first thing is, because where I lived in Southern California, there wasn't anywhere for me to canoe. So I did have a couple of canoe excursions where I went to the Colorado River. I went up to a, a place called Lake Elsinore to paddle, but <clears throat> none of that was really much in a way of preparation for what I was going to encounter. Uh, nothing can train you to paddle up the St. Lawrence River in springtime against the current except paddling up the St. Lawrence River in the springtime against the current. That's about the only way you can do that. But I did physically condition myself well. I did lots of running. I had a hill that climbed 700 feet. I used to run that regularly. Uh, I had a, 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 a cross from where I lived was, it was a, a very rural area, big typical Southern California dry sandy area across the road from me. I used to run there quite a bit uh, for conditioning, did a lot of weight training. Uh, I was um, I probably overtrained if I look back on it. I, I worked so hard to be fit that by the time I left, I was, pretty, I was needing a vacation before I took the trip. But uh, <clears throat> so I did, I did a lot of physical training, but it was hard for me to actually get a lot of time in a canoe because I didn't live near canoeing water. Uh, uh, let's see. Well, uh, someone has asked me, would I read for you? And maybe, maybe that might be it. I don't know what, you, I, I don't know what your timeline, uh, Stephanie, what's, is there a timeline that I should be shooting for here? It's, it's 6.45, should I figure another five minutes or so, something like that, I, I, it's up to you. Uh, whatever you're comfortable with, we can, um, we have it set to end at seven, but we can keep going beyond that if we need to, perfectly fine. Okay, well, let me, uh, so it's a good uh, a suggestion. I'll read a little bit from the book, get a flavor of my writing perhaps, and uh, I'll, I'll read, I, I've, in case I was asked, I've got, a sample here. It's a short chapter, so feel free to take a nap, whatever you'd like to do. Uh, it's Solitude is the name of the chapter. It takes, it's an incident that takes place on the Churchill River, which is quite a ways north uh, by that time. I probably had traveled uh, a couple thousand miles, I suppose, by that time. And uh, the Churchill's a grand part of the fur trade route. It drains all the waters from uh, south of the Clearwater River over to Hudson's Bay. It's a huge watershed. Uh, and it's a big, very big part of how the voyagers and traders got, and trappers got into the interior of Canada was through the Churchill River system. And I am paddling up it and it's quite, it's quite big and so many sections of it are lake-like because they are so broad and there's not a great deal of current that you have to contend with because of that big body of the water. But I had this incident that I'm about to read to you took place on the Churchill. <clears throat> Chapter 17, Solitude. Everything was different, strange. Overnight, there had been an elemental shift in my universe. Outside my tent, a white smothering moistness awaited an intensity of ground fog heretofore unknown to me. Jimon and I had camped the night before on the shore of one of the many lakes ballooning out along the length of the Churchill. But it seemed possible I awoke in a different land, an alien one. Restarting the campfire, I made a cup of tea and held it close as a defense against the chill that marinated deep into bones and soul. With courage being required on those days when melancholy visited camp, I reluctantly loaded Jimon and then, after running out of excuses, doused the fire. 
Soon the rhythmic dipping of my paddle and the corresponding surge as Yaman's bow cut through the dense green-black waters were the only intrusion in that foreign place. Not a hint of sun breached the overhead and undefined shapes filled in where there should have been a shoreline. Surely on that mysterious morning, Kraken prowled nearby. Suddenly from across the water, an unseen loon startled me. Its cry, a mournful sound on a morning already leaning towards sad. I stopped paddling. The splash barely audible as my fellow wanderer dove. We both held our breath. A disturbing amount of time later, breathing resumed when it broke the surface. Then, from its new location, another eerie call. Was it seeking its mate? Or, like me, was this North Woods dweller simply overcome by the milky solitude and shared? I didn't know, but for me, it was only solitude, not loneliness. I already knew what that could feel like. The USS Telfair, a long ago decommissioned troop carrier, would not have been anyone's first choice for a Mediterranean cruise. Her accommodations were lousy, but like all those Marines who had sailed on her before, we adapted and made it our home. Floating around the Mediterranean, we went over the nets and on liberty with equal fervor. Sometimes getting banged up climbing the nets, other times when fists flew on foreign docks. It was late. I had come up from the cavernous interior of the ship to get some space and air. On that night of gentle seas and brisk air, the December moon floated majestically just above the horizon. Then, while staring out over the rail, surrounded by 1,500 Marines and sailors, I was instantly overcome by a loneliness that nearly dropped me, an ache so acute and powerful it might have been a heart attack. I don't think I cried out, but wouldn't have been surprised if someone had said I had. Never experienced anything like it before, and to this day I dreaded ever returning. Eventually, the sensation passed, leaving behind only perspiration and weak knees. On that eerie day in an isolated place, an unseen water creature had shared with me what might have been its epic loneliness, perhaps one like mine in that December night at sea, but I hope not. No one, neither loons nor humans, should ever feel that alone. When the sun finally broke through, my companion and our morning of shared solitude were left behind. Voluntarily withdrawing from the demands of family and occupation was, no doubt, self-indulgent. But I enjoyed that life where concerns were basic and limited. Weather and water, food, shelter, maps, and asthma. As in combat, life in a canoe has none of those ambiguous gray areas we face in the normal conduct of life. A lone traveler in remote country, most of the time I was required to be considered of only myself. Aside from those constant internal ones, conversations were rare, decisions generally quick, following an assessment of risk and vulnerability. And when something went awry in isolated places, I was the only one there to talk it over. Some ripples tried to pester me during those moments and months of isolation, but I never looked back. Nothing was allowed to catch up. That only happened years later when, after time with a fine psychologist, I was able to address a long journey's wise, not just its hows. Chapter 17. So that gives you a feeling for some of the how and why part of the the book, um, and uh, it was a very, it was a very therapeutic thing to write, and I'm a happier man for having done it. And I won't take it back, damn it. So let's see what. I, <clears throat> have I spoken at a rendezvous reenactment? No, I haven't, and I have. It hasn't occurred to me uh, to re. Uh, and I, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, Therese. Uh, I haven't, I haven't done. It hasn't occurred to me to do that. Uh, um, it, my, my trip wasn't a reenactment. 
trip. I wasn't pretending I was a voyager. I was just trying to travel from A and if possible make it all the way to Z. I only got to about M, uh, but um, the history of the fur trout was, of course, a fur trade route was something I had to be familiar with because by osmosis, I absorbed a lot just uh, in understanding the route I'd be taking. Uh, when I started out, I got two sets of maps. One set of maps was the scale of one to 250,000. The other map was generally one to 100,000. What that means is the scale of the map, one was one inch on the map represents 250,000 inches of terrain. I can't remember, I, I don't wanna mislead you. I, I, I can't remember what the relationship is now. I, I think it's uh, one inches, four miles or something like that is what it works out to. And that's the map I did my general planning on. So I'd read the, f I'd read various accounts uh, of people who had traveled some part of that route. And I would plot that on that large scale map. And that's the one I used to figure out where I'd have my supplies cached. Which is another part of the story is, you know, how, how did I get my food when I was traveling? Because I didn't start out with all of it. Uh, I followed on that map where there were settlements because of course Canada was settled along the waterways. So certainly in this first part of my trip where there were settlements readily available to me and I would mail uh, packages to myself that had say another pair of socks and other things I thought I might need plus food and I my planning between places where I would have food cached I I figured I can't remember now what I figured for calories a day but I uh, I each one of my parcels was that amount of food I'd need for the next trip plus 30 percent so I always had extra calories at least by a calorie count to see me through and I so I I always, I never was short of food. Uh, I was all freeze dried food. Uh, I sometimes was short of the energy to eat it, but I was never short of food. Uh, and then the other set of maps was the, the maps I took with me. So those were a smaller scale. Those, you needed those maps to navigate with. You couldn't navigate with the larger scale. And they're the ones where I could pick out across that body of water is where that river is and that's a bay, you know, and, and so forth. So, uh, although I had a lot of experience as a scout in Vietnam with map reading and compasses, uh, it's a little bit different when you're always sitting in a canoe, which is always moving, it gets a little more difficult. So you have to learn to do quick reads and constant reads to check and recheck yourself because if you make mistakes, you pay for it. You pay for it dearly. You pay for it in a lot of hard work to paddle back from where you went to the wrong place and paddle to the right place. So you become pretty adept that way. Um, but rendezvous, it, you know, it wasn't really, I, I wasn't, I wasn't pretending I was a trapper. I didn't have, you know, I didn't have buckskins. I didn't. I don't. I don't know that my trip would be particularly interesting. They're they're at rendezvous. What little I know about them, they're sort of all about the lifestyle of the voyagers, and it's certainly an interesting lifestyle that they lived. Well, if there's no more questions. I'll close by saying you've been, it's been lovely to have the opportunity to talk to you. I hope there's been some entertainment value here. And uh, I hope we all get back to leading a normal life pretty soon. Um, 
uh, and you're welcome. And I hope you enjoy your book. Now, uh, you can you can certainly buy my book in any of the outlets, any any independent bookstores, or you can go to Stephanie and demand absolutely demand that she buy a copy for the Blue Island Library. Don't take no for an answer. Buy a book. We love getting demands for books at the library. <laughs> <laughs> so if so, I, I'd hope that you'd enjoy it. And if you do, then in the back, I have an email address that I have specifically for the book. Uh, I'll tell it to you now. You don't have to remember it. It's on the back page of the book. It's, it's Yellow Canoe Story. My book is, my canoe was yellow, so it's my Yellow Canoe Story at Gmail. And... Uh, I always enjoy hearing from people. I've, it, it's been it's been wonderful. I've I've heard from people I went to high school with who read this book accidentally, and in it I mentioned my high school. Uh, I've, I've made contact with two guys. One of them I never even knew from high school. He was in kind of a different section, and he's he's read it, and he and I communicate fairly regularly now. So it's it's been a, a nice, I had a guy from England who was a canoeist contact me and tell me how much he enjoyed the book. So it's, it's uh, been an interesting, all the little side stories that happened after the book was published. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll leave you with one last story in that regard. Again, on the Churchill River, I met two men who were canoeing. They were canoeing up behind me. I thought I heard voices and I turned and looked and I, you know, I, I, I saw these two guys coming and they were uh, uh, the study in contrast. The guy in the front was pale as pale can be, he was translucent, he was so white. And the guy behind was just the opposite. He was nut brown and he was obviously a First Nations man. The guy in the back, Rodney Allen Bobblewash, was a college professor who was uh, working on his doctorate. Uh, and he was exploring his own family's history along the Churchill. Carl Reimer, the translucent guy in the bow, uh, was one of his students. Uh, we had a short but very memorable meeting on the Churchill, we spent a night together and then I went my way and they went their way. Uh, Carl invited me to his wedding. Uh, it was really interesting, but recently I got contact from the Canadian Canoe Museum in Peterborough and the curator of the magazine, uh, the curator of the museum, uh, when I told him a little bit about my book, he said, yeah, I w I'd like to have a copy of that because Rodney Allen Bobawash was my professor in college. And Rodney is now, unfortunately, he, he has since died. But it's funny, all these little stories that come around with time. And on that story, I'll say good night to you. Thank you for your participation. And I hope if you do read the book that you enjoy it. And just don't, don't hesitate to send me a... Uh, a, a note and let me know. And if you don't like it, you can tell me that also. I won't pay attention, but you can certainly tell me. <laughs> and on that, I'll, I'll say goodnight.